gather together and study your word for that you'll bless our time together tonight. Uh, even though this is a shorter passage, I pray that you'll help it to be something that is applicable and helpful to us. Um, I pray that we'll approach your word uh, humbly and with an open mind. And, uh, thank you for what you're going to show us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We're winding down our study in the book of Jude. Um, if all goes according to plan, which things rarely do, uh, we'll be... <laughs> We have three verses tonight, then Winged will close us out with the doxology next week, and then on to the next thing. So, I will not be here next week. I'm actually hosting a discussion at uh, my alma mater about uh, Hebrew narratives uh, in the Old Testament and what they can tell us um, about Hebrew culture. So, um, I'll be doing that instead of this. So, you guys will have to pick a, uh, a vote on and then discuss on a book or a topic for our next study. And we and I can get together and kind of uh, come to a uh, conclusion on that. That's next week for you, though. This week, we got some review. So uh, we're not going to ask the book the question, who wrote the book of Jude? Because you guys did so great with that last week. We are going to ask the question, what is the book of Jude written to address? Antinomianism. Yeah, look at that. Most likely antinomianism. It's not called out in the book specifically, but I think that um, we've beaten to death the topic that what is the thing that the illustrations that Jude is using, the sorts of things he's he's calling out, seems to be antinomianism. What is antinomianism? Hint, it's the opposite of the Judaizers. Yeah, exactly. Against the law. So antinomians say, there are no rules! You can do whatever you want! And Jude's like, yeah. Not really. Um, and then used all of the illustrations about the people who uh, who disobeyed God, kind of flagrantly rebelled against God, and broke commandments. Yeah, exactly, Jude. You gotta be an example, sure, yeah. Alright, good. Uh, what do we... What did we talk about last week? Antinomianism. Good, we talked about that. <laughs> Specifically, what about it? Yes. Good. That is the one thing that people seem to be getting from last week. Ungodly. Yep. Uh, so Jude is making the point that just in case you were confused, uh, these teachers are ungodly. They are not Christian. They're not close to being Christian. They are ungodly. They have nothing to do with God. This is not, this message they're giving you is, is not the message of the scriptures. It's going to be judged. And beyond that, their motives are wrong. Their motives are selfish. Their motives are trying to um, satisfy their own sinful desires, their own base desires. So they're doing the wrong things for the wrong reason at the wrong time, which is the opposite of doing the right thing. All right, good. Um, so this week, we're going to... We, I mentioned last week that we were going to talk about... Um, how the the believers that Jude is writing to are supposed to respond to this false teaching. The first thing was they're not supposed to be surprised, right? They're supposed to be surprised because everybody's been talking about these people. Old Testament, New Testament, we've been warned, even Jesus, we've been warned that these guys are coming, so it shouldn't be a surprise to see false teachers. It is perhaps uh, more alarming if we look around we don't see any false teachers because uh, <laughs> it means we're probably stuck in false teaching, right? We, 
Uh, but but yeah, so um, they shouldn't be surprised. This week, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, Jude gives us three kind of things that the people in that he's writing to are supposed to do. So, um, let's have a volunteer to read verses 20 through 23. Say, as for volunteers, remembers everybody is either sick or tired, or sick and or, tired, or eating. Sorry, it's okay. You don't want to I hear got, me chewing. I got this, guys. Don't worry, I, I got this. I, <laughs> I can do it. Don't worry. <laughs> um, every so I don't know if you have like a upper respiratory cold, but everybody around here has like this death rattle cold where they get super like they can't breathe for like two weeks and they have a fever for like five days. It's brutal. I have not gotten it yet, but I hope you don't have that. I, it hasn't been that bad yet. It's, it's incubated in the church nursery. <laughs> oh, oh, there's great. nothing That's like awesome. setting setting someone up for you know misery. Thanks for that. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> the church nursery always is a good place to go if you want to get sick. Okay, <laughs> so verses twenty through twenty three. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. And you guys have been around here long enough to know that that last phrase probably has some sort of, uh, shall we say, colorful original language tie to it. And it does. Um, but we'll gain that in a moment. Okay, so, but you, beloved, building yourself up in the most holy faith. What does that mean? What's he calling them what to do there? Strengthening themselves in the tenets of their faith and in their personal relationship with God. Yeah. Well said. Yeah, so they're strengthening themselves in the tense of the faith, so they're understanding the faith more and their personal relationship with God. That, and they're tied together, right? I sort of trick questioned you guys, um, but you're getting too smart for this crap. <laughs> um, by saying, what does that first one mean? But they're tied together, right? He, he leaves them, he ties them together and praying in the Holy Spirit. So, um, again, Christianity is more than just an intellectual exercise. It's a personal relationship, right? Uh, and, and we pray not just to ask for things for God, but not just to ask for things from God, but so that God can work on us and change us, right? Sometimes we pray and our circumstance doesn't change, but we change. So sometimes means most of the time. <laughs> but that's that's kind of so so the the study and the prayer, the the intellectual growth and the personal relationship are tied together in Christianity. They're tied together in this verse here too. <laughs> oh boy, Kessa hitting on my other hot button topic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um so Study and prayer, right? They're working on that personal relationship. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Waiting on, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Keep yourselves in the love of God. What does that mean? Doesn't God save us? So how do we keep ourselves in the love of God? Go ahead, Cass. I don't want to take all the questions, but I think it's related to don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Yeah, I think that's good. Winged to ask trick questions in the chat. I don't know, Winged. Would it? I'll bet you don't know. <laughs> 
Let me have my corned beef and cabbage. Comes to study, talks about food the entire time to try and distract me. I def I I want someone else to time, okay? I'm just I'm just throwing out options. Cute. What does it mean to keep something? If I tell you to keep the faith, or I give you money, and I say keep this money. Yeah, guard, protect, exactly. Yeah. Go through the wash. Yeah, uh, we our washer yeah. broke this week, and it was just sitting there filled with water. At the bottom of the washer was a rifle round. So Lady Ungrith pulls it out of the washer, and she's like, "Were you bathing this for some reason?" <laughs> yeah, it's, it's. I like to bathe my ammo before I shoot it. <laughs> he wants to make sure he's got. He wants to make sure he's got clean shots. Yeah, exactly. I'll say it fires so much better when it's clean. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it uh, it's it's totally corroded, it's totally trash now, but uh, <laughs> it turned totally green. But yeah, so that one will not be going through the rifle. However, um, yeah, uh, I did not keep that uh, that ammo very well there. But yeah, competitive shooter I know uh, once said that competitor shooter families are just like every other family, except for when they go through the wash, they have to take out all the bullets and put them in the little piles on top of the washing machine. It's kind of how it is. Um, yeah, so way off topic here. However, to keep guard, yeah, I did not do that. The, not not letting it wind up in the wash, not just letting it go and and disappear through negligence. Exactly. Keep yourselves in the love of God. So we know that we don't save ourselves, right? But this is very similar to what the Galatians were told to do, right? We just finished up a study in Galatians. They're told to to kind of guard their faith in a sense that don't forget, right? Don't forget what you were taught. Don't forget that you are are saved by through Christ's mercy, right? Don't forget these things. And that is something we have to do, right? Because <laughs> I don't know about you, but unless I make a conscious effort to to remember the truths of the Bible, things like saved through faith, you know, not through works, things like, hey, like these these commands that God give me, God gives me, they're for my own good. They're not just to tell me how to do things. If I don't consciously remind myself of those things and review those things daily, sometimes multiple times a day, it winds up like that that rifle round that just sits in the bottom of the washer in the water for like three days, right? It just it's <laughs> it it just kind of gets neglected and, and disappears very quickly. So they're being told to keep those things, to remember those things, dwell on those things. That's that's part of the part of that relationship we talked about. Keep going back to those things. Remember those things. Make an effort to to keep guard, protect that mentally so that you don't forget and so that these teachers don't make you forget. Yeah, exactly, Cass. Waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. So again, we're not saved of ourselves. We're not saved even because we're better than these antinomian guys, right? Because we're not. But, but you're supposed to build yourselves up in faith in response to them. To keep yourself in the love of God. And then, again, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remembering that it's not, you're not better than them, like Kess said. You're, you're saved by Christ's mercy. That leads to eternal life. You're not saved by keeping these commandments that they're telling you you don't have to keep. Because you don't keep them to get saved. You keep them because God has told us to <laughs> keep his commandments. Yeah. He's building up your humility as he's teaching you to respond to these false teachers. That's important, right? Because 
<laughs> because how do, how do we tend to respond to people we disagree with in today's day and age? Red haze. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty good one, yeah. Yep. Also by Sky responds that way to everybody, but you know. <laughs> He beat me to it. <laughs> right, we just go make an angry Facebook rant. We freak out with rage like Bob says. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it, it's interesting that before being told like the first thing that we're told to do in response to these people so instead you know he says in the beginning but you beloved what are we supposed to do is that we're, we're basically humble by what he tells us to do draw close to god right and be humble remember that you're not saved by yourself which is an interesting kind of like wing said a paradoxical response something that we're not used to okay that is verses one and two. Any comments on those verses before we go to the next two? Cool, okay. Then we're given three action steps here. So there's some debate as to how this should all be translated, unsurprisingly. Um, most commentators pull out kind of a, a triplet here, so three different responses. Um, I think that that's the best way to do this. Um, not because I'm a Greek expert. I am not. Um, I have never been able to speak Greek. Um, I'm, I'm, I used to be pretty good at Hebrew. I'm, I'm rusty on that even. But uh, the reason why I say that, uh, that I think it should be three, is because it, it lines up well with the le rest of the letter. Jude has been writing in kind of um, triplets of thought. Um, he uses three examples at the opening, um, talks about three different illustrations a lot of the way through here. So I think it makes sense for him to go with three responses here. He likes threes. So, uh, because of that, yep, exactly. Because I, I think that the translation here does a pretty good job. So first, and have mercy on those who doubt. Okay, what does that mean? Not rejecting the heretics as human beings? Hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, I think I think that's part of it. I think though here, um, he's more talking about. There you go. I think Bob's got it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think these are people who are kind of starting to doubt and have have struggle with their faith because of their life circumstances or because of things that these teachers are teaching. So instead of coming over them and doing the Hulk smash or keyboard cat thing, um, <laughs> which I cannot pull my eyes away from, <laughs> the uh, uh, so instead of doing doing that, we're supposed to have mercy on them. How does that look? What does it mean to have mercy on somebody who's doubting? Yeah, I think so.
Yep. So taking the time to sit down and discuss things with them in a non-judgmental, listening, non-rejecting way, right? Because if somebody is, um, say, buying into a antinomian philosophy or a, or a prosperity gospel philosophy or whatever, ha- whatever have you, sort of wrong theology, um, just coming up to them and just unleashing on them is, is not going to be the way to go, right? <laughs> Uh, that's that's not gonna that's not gonna help further the conversation. From James, we're supposed to be what? The quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Okay, so that that still applies here. So quick to listen, we should hear hear them out. Slow to speak, let them speak about kind of all their thoughts and feelings. And, and a lot of times, what you'll find is if you ask them questions, they'll they'll start to uncover the answers themselves, right? Um, uh, and then slow to wrath. Do not. These are not people that we're going to be getting angry at here. People who are who are starting to encounter some doubts, doubts because of these false teachers. <laughs> All right. So, one response. Next, save others by snatching them out of the fire. What does that mean? I think this would be a global level talk. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That is that is an excellent illustration. Yep. <laughs> Looks like crowds in here. Okay, I can use this this illustration. So um, I was, uh, I, I, one of the magazines I read every month, I read two magazines. One of them is, uh, National Air and Space Museum. They do really interesting articles about everything from, like, the history of flight to modern things. So they had an article last month, the month before, about airline flight attendants. I'm like, this is going to be a stupid article. I'm, I'm here for the history war stuff, right? But <laughs> I, I was bored, so I read it. It was a fascinating article, and um, one of the things that I learned was that airline flight tents are, like, the, the whole, like, bringing you water and chips thing, that is, like, just window dressing. That's to calm you down. The reason why they're there is to save your life in the case of emergency. So they're incredibly well trained on, like, fire procedures and medical things and all these different things. We're getting there, Hudbus. So... <laughs> So, so Hudbus, we are we are talking about. He's Sorry, he's not in the channel. Never mind. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, back to the illustration. So, um, the the most people don't know this though. We think of them almost as like, like waiters and waitresses, right? So, one of and I'm going to clean up the language on this a little bit, but one of the flight attendants who is a flight attendant for like, twenty five years, the line she would use with people is, "I'm here to save your butt, not kiss it," right? <laughs> So the people who are, are there to to save you from the fire often are not the most polite, like gentle people, right? Um, I have been firemen carried by somebody. I have firemen carried other people. Um, it's not the most pleasant experience, but um, it's it's what you need, right? You don't you don't need somebody being like super gentle with you if you're being they're trying to drag you out of a burning building, they're trying to save you from fire, right? So this is a different response. Than the, than the response of somebody who's doubting. This is somebody else who needs, like Kessa said, a global level inter- intervention. Yeah. It's kind of a tough love thing. And sometimes this feels kind of, kind of uncomfortable. In fact, it usually does, like I said. <laughs> Not very fun being firemen carried out of a place. Not very, yeah. Not the uh, uh, the flight attendants are actually taught to to yell at people and scream at them if they're not paying attention in an emergency because that's how you get them. That's how you save their lives, right? The show them around and stuff. So so sometimes you need you need that. Yeah. The it's not not very uh, not very uh, uh, a, a fun experience, but it's needed sometimes. 
So how do we tell the difference? That car is a previous relationship with them and some knowledge of the person that they are and where they're at in their lives, wouldn't it? Yep. Yep, that's exactly it. It's true. Generally speaking, if you have to be urgent to, quote, snatch someone out of a fire, or as Fonger said, you know, you know, fireman's carry or something, those are kind of emergency circumstances. And normally, if someone will, if you've been urgent, just kind of, as, as the previous one said, the, we're talking about mercy and grace, you know, if you've been gently nudging someone in a particular direction and they haven't responded, that shows stubbornness. So stubbornness is kind of the hallmark of when you're going to reach this point, I feel like. It's also sort of an extreme situation, right? So somebody yeah. who's about to be burned up by a fire that's that's not very often i can probably count on one hand maybe two hands the amount of times i've had to do this with people in my entire life right have this kind of probably one hand um this intervention with person with people one of the times by the way i was wrong that's fun um <laughs> <laughs> yeah whereas the the um just showing mercy to people who doubt right that's much more common much 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 more common Like I said, the, the existing relationship is key, right? So um, going back to the save from a fire example, um, one of the, the most tough things about trying to save someone is that they'll panic and they'll try to fight you. And you can't firemen's carry somebody who is fighting you, right? So one of the things I teach you in first aid medical classes sometimes is sometimes you have to wait for people to like pass out before you can start helping them <laughs> because, because they're going to be fighting you, right? So so yeah, so the trust thing is a big thing. If I trust someone, I'm going to be much more willing to to listen to them when I try to intervene and have that that tough tough global talk with me, if you will, right? So that that, that like I said, it pre presupposes an existing relationship. You can't just come in and blow up at somebody and expect them to to trust you. In fact, one of the times when I did this with someone, um, I wound up having to, I, I, that's actually kind of how it played out, was I had this tough talk conversation with them. They came back and I said, man, I didn't know you hated me so much. And I'm like, no, I'm not having it because I hate you. I'm having it because I love you. If I hated you, I wouldn't care to have this conversation. And they came back a couple of days later and they're like, hey, you know what? You're right. Like, thanks for having that conversation. I think that I was destroying myself here. So it's it's one of those things where you that like like I said that 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 trust that re existing relationship is a you can't do it without that. And it has to be done for the right reason, right? Because it has to be done in humility. If it's done in pride, people are going to pick up on that. And it's not going to not going to do any good. All right. So that's have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear. Hating even the garment stained by the flesh. What is going on here? That sounds like an allusion to leprosy. So it isn't in the Greek, but Judah is Hebrew. And Judah has been referencing Old Testament um, Jewish traditions and things all throughout this, this letter. So there was one of the commentators I was reading was saying that this is, uh, although not often identified as an allusion to lepr leprosy, um, should be, because that's what Jude is trying to do here. The Old Testament leprosy regulation of um, burning a leper's clothes. 
so that it doesn't affect the rest of the camp. So good job, Kess. Yeah, so the um in in the in Greek, um uh, that garment is a that's that word chiton. Uh it's kind of that undergarment. Uh, stained by the flesh. Um the the idea is this carries the idea this is a nasty garment. Somebody said even carries the connotation of it being like covered in excrement. Although uh, that's how a Greek audience would probably read it. Uh, I, I'm more inclined to take Kess's uh example of this, of the leprosy, because I think that's how the, the Jewish audience, Jews writing to would take it. Okay, so we got that now. How does that help us understand? <laughs> how does this help that help us understand what's what he's being what's being talked about here? In this in this third example. Bye Bob. Your headache goes away. Yeah, Kess. So there's some debate. Some people think this is somebody who's really far gone. Some people who think it's actually the false teachers themselves. Either way, um, this is showing mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. So it's somebody who is is pretty far into this false teaching. Uh, to the point where um, there's a concern that the false teaching could spread off of them, right? So somebody who we're going to show mercy to, but with fear, right? Not for ourselves, but for, well, maybe for ourselves, but for the community, right? Because this is a community letter. This letter is meant to be read, read in the context of community. All these things in the context of community for Jude. So the, the concern would be that uh, this person, the false teaching, the antinomianism, they're so far into it um, that by other people, uh, by them being part of the community here, they could continue to spread that antinomian. So we're still going to love them. We're still going to show show mercy to them. But we got to be careful with that, right? We, we want to make sure that we're not giving a platform for that or helping it spread. This idea that, yes, we love them. We don't feel prideful towards them. But, but we're not going to give a platform to that. We're not going to help that spread. We're going to hate that garment, right? We're not going to give a platform to that false teaching. How does that look? How do we do that? If you figure it out, let me know, because we've been trying to do it around here for the last 13 years. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, the silence is kind of, um, yeah. Uh, the silence is kind of the thing, right? So it's, I think it's going to look different in each context. Um, I think it means that we don't let um, people who believe certain things and buy into certain false teachings, we don't let them have a position of authority in the church. Um, certainly not a teaching role, right? Um, but but how that looks specifically, how do you do that? How do you deny them those opportunities and still show mercy to them and let them be part of the community? It's tough. It's tough. It's something that each community kind of has to work through and 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 come up with in their own specific instance. I think that's why Jude doesn't give us specifics here, but he gives us the 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 attitude, the principle with which to apply, right? I know around here it's been something we've we've struggled with a lot, uh, more so back in the forum days, less so now in the Discord days. Uh, but yeah, we've there's lots of people come to me and want to leave Bible study, and <laughs> not all of them, uh, not all of them are uh, are, are going to get that opportunity uh, from Winged and I just because just because we take it seriously about what sorts of things we we allow to be taught in the community, right? And it's tough for us because we we're a non-denominational community, but we still have to kind of draw some theological lines, right? So yeah, 
Those are always fun conversations. Those usually end with, oh, so you hate me. Yeah. No. <laughs> just just, just can't give you the platform for that right now. For, for one reason or another. Yeah. What's really interesting about this is that this is a letter written to the whole church, right? So the implication is that these three responses and how we wrestle through them to the false teaching is something that not just the church leaders, not just the council members, council advisors, those people, <laughs> um, not just the elder and the pastors are going to have to wrestle through. It's for the whole community to wrestle through, right? We get this idea in the American church that, of, of like, oh, this is a problem for our leaders. Uh -uh. That's a problem for all of us, guys. So the the in the book of Revelation, when we did that study, uh, uh, one of the things that we saw was that the churches, the people in the church, not just the leaders, were held accountable for what was being taught in the church, right? So the idea is that, that the accountability comes from the grassroots up. So um, we are responsible for what sorts of things we allow to be taught and for the, the heresies and the teachings that go around the church. So because of that, Everybody, everybody in the church, universal and specific, everybody, as in like all of you guys here and you guys in your local churches are responsible for, for, for responding to these, to false teachers that are out there. And you're, the options that, you know, we're told to do so in humility, like we talked about in the beginning, and then we've kind of given some three options here for how to respond to it. We're responsible, each one of us is responsible for working through that, not just leaders. Wingen raised his hand as I've been waiting patiently. Go ahead, Wingen. You don't know that I've been waiting patiently. I could have been roaming around and just raging. Hulk smashing, like the meme. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just because it, it intrigues me, I, I, I was wondering, you know, what's the Greek word for fear there in verse 23? Any guesses? Or anybody know straight up without looking it up? I'm looking it up. I know you're looking it up. <laughs> it's a Greek word I think you guys will very much recognize. Greek word is phobio. Oh, interesting. Yeah. It's the connotation here is to be terrified to the point where you draw away from something, you pull back. You, you don't approach it at all. You 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 turn and go the other way. And so it, every, the this triplet here, like Anger said, it's kind of an escalation. You have these guys that you just you know you show mercy to because you know it's just you know you be kind to them. Some people you have to you know you got to be a little more firm with than other people where they're just so far down the rabbit hole. You have to be like, look, I just got to pull back. I I can't. I can't be a part of this because it scares me the possibility of what you could do if given a platform. Which is like super, you know, it, it, it sounds really strong and I think it is. So I just found that interesting. No, thank you for pulling that out. I didn't even catch that. Interesting, it's in Greek, right? So the ties to the Greek god of fear, Phobos. Phobos. Yep. Which the idea is like Phobos was that was a battlefield god. So the people who would like just like lose their minds and flee from the field uncontrollably. Yeah. So it's, it's connotations of that. Obviously, Jude's not pagan. But yeah, I don't think I don't think he's really trying to draw any parallel there. You know, because all of his examples have been very Jewish, so I think trying to throw that in there might be might be trying to, you know, a little bit right. of easy there if we were to try that, but we're not. We're not. <laughs> no. Right, right. So I'm not, I'm not saying that he's trying to reference the God specifically, but the word for a Greek-speaking audience would, mm -hmm. would be tied to that. So, it, it, you know, it's a connotative thing, not a denotative. Right. Yeah.
So I'm going to give you a specific example about this. I've overused the example, but we'll use it one more time because it fits. Um, the, <laughs> the 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 kind of cult that that uh, that rose up when I was in college, right? The one that um, I told you guys about this. A bunch of of weird um, kind of we called hyper experientialists at the time of um, things uh, with one of the student groups on campus at this college I went to sophomore year. Um, one of my friends who's now a theology professor. Uh, launched what he called Operation Berean to try and uh, respond to what uh, he saw was a he saw as a dangerous situation arising. Um, I failed to recognize the danger until after he enlisted me in the operation. Started digging into it and realized, holy crap, we got a really weird abusive cult thing going on here. So we responded in three ways, right? Some people we just talk people who are kind of having doubts might be kind of messing it with it a little bit. We pulled them aside, kind of listened to, said, you know, hey, why, why are you getting involved with this? What, why, why do you think this is a good idea? Let's heard them out, um, gave them some reasons as to maybe why it's not a good idea. Um, and that was enough, right? Other people we pulled aside, people we had relationships with, said, this is, this is freaking dangerous, right? There's some really weird stuff going on here, some really abusive stuff. You've got to get out. And I'm telling you that for your own good, like this is this is really, really bad. Uh, I had the tough talk with them, right? The the leaders themselves, specifically the one leader, um, we actually got uh my friend, not not me in this part, but he went to the dean of students um and the campus chaplain and brought forth some evidence and got the guy um banned from college, right? Banned from campus. Um and what that did is it forced a decision for a lot of people. Either they're going to follow the guy off campus into a different state, or they're going to stick with us. But, um, but yeah, we he did that for the good of, of the community, right? Because you want to give that, in, in that particular circumstance, to continue to allow him on campus was to give him a platform, right? So, different ways of responding. Yep. Silence is consent, as we always say in communications. So what I love about that uh, example, too, is that my friend was the one who led the charge, right? He was a student at the time, a theology student, but a student. So he's not a leader on campus. He was not in student government, not in RA, none of that things. Um, but but he was the one who kind of uncovered all of this stuff and and led the charge in trying to save people from what became a cult. Uh, so again, good example of somebody in the church, not a leader, right? A layman stepping up to the plate and um, and taking action and holding the false teachers accountable uh, and trying to to show love to and to have a tough talk with some of the people who were following the false teachers, right? So how do we apply this this week? What do we take from this and and go forth into our week with? That's yeah, so true. And it's one of the first things that goes when our schedule gets crazy, right? But it's one of the first, it's what, I mean, it's what Jude says is your first response to these things, right? That's how you don't get led astray is by staying in the word and in prayer. Anything else?
Yep, also true. I would agree with um, both of those. You know, the the responses to the false teaching, are we going to encounter every day? No. Well, maybe. Oh, Facebook. That. <laughs> we all know how I feel about social media. Um, but uh, The great evil. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, but we are going to encounter, right? We shouldn't be surprised by it. Are, are we? I think that the the big things are going to be. Don't let the study and devotional time slip. Uh, that's a big thing. That's, I'm trying to get back to too. Uh, is discipline time around that? Even, even if it's a short amount of time each day, guys, just discipline time each day. Um, and then um, how the response needs to be motivated by humility, right? I don't know about you guys, but um, sometimes sometimes I like speaking out about things that are wrong because it makes me feel good because I like to have my ego stroked by myself. And that's incredibly dangerous. Um, that is counterproductive and will undermine what undermine the good that I'm trying to do by that. So our responses need to be motivated by humility. And that's what I love about what Jude says here is he goes out, goes after these guys, and then he turns to these guys and he, and he starts talking to the believers there. And you expect them to say, hey, like, you guys are better than this. But he doesn't. He reminds them to be humble first, right? He gives, gives them, a, he talks, tells them, hey, like, don't like, stay in your devotions, stay in prayer, be humble, and then respond like this. And then we're like, wait, like, <laughs> what about the righteous indignation you were just having, Jude? And he has that, but it has to be still wrapped with and, and, and come from a center of humility. That's something I, something I struggle with in responding to false teaching sometimes. So, uh, and not just false teaching, but other areas of life too. So that's that's my big takeaway. Yeah, exactly. Wingen. All right. Last call. Any anything else jumps out at you guys before we close out in prayer? That's all I got. So um, we'll start taking prayer requests.